Okay, so good evening, everybody. The uh, third class tonight out of four is the story called The Knife, which is found in uh, Ruth Calderon's book, A Bride for One Night, beginning on page 99. So this story is different. We're not dealing with uh, women in uh, this story. Uh, this is a classic story of um, what the rabbis think about other rabbis. Okay, so I'm going to read the story that is on page 99. Um, I trust that you read Calderon's version of the story. But we'll, uh, I want to highlight several aspects of this story. It's a fascinating story. Rabbi Yehoshua ben Levi clung to them, meaning the lepers, and studied Torah. How did he interpret the verse, a loving doe, a graceful mountain goat? If the Torah graces those who learn it, will it not also protect me? When he was about to die, the angel of death was told, Go and do his, that is, Rabbi Yehoshua ben Levi's will, and let him die however he chooses. The angel of death went and appeared before him, meaning the angel of death appeared before Rabbi Yehoshua ben Levi. He, Rabbi Yehoshua ben Levi, said to him, said to the angel of death, show me my place in the world to come. So point is, Yehoshua ben Levi is not dead yet. He sees the angel of death, and before the angel of death gets to kill Yoshua ben Levi, Yoshua ben Levi says, show me my place in the world to come. I want to I want to know where my seats are. You know, do I have good seats on the eastern wall? You know, is it a penthouse or is it a shack? That's what he wants to see. He said, the angel of death said to Yoshua ben Levi, surely. He, Yoshua ben Levi, said to the angel of death, Give me your knife, lest I be frightened by it along the way. Okay, so how, did he, how does the angel of death do his job? By using a knife. Yoshua ben Levi wants the knife. But he, but he, was, told, he was told that he could get, tell Angel of death was told by God, Go and do his will, and let him die however he chooses. So Yoshua ben Levi, right? So the angel of death has to listen to Yoshua ben Levi. That is right. So Yoshua ben Levi first wants, before I die, show me where I'm going. And secondly, give me your knife. So why? Why, do we, why does he want the knife? Not, be, not for any other ulterior motive other than lest I be frightened by it along the way. Like, in other words, you might kill me along the way. So let me hold the knife, okay? So if you don't mind, angel of death, he, the angel of death gave it to him. When they got there, that is to the wall of heaven, he lifted him up. That is the angel of death lifted up Yehoshua ben Levi, and showed Yehoshua ben Levi his place in the world to come. All right, does that look good? Like this, like imagine you're outside a baseball stadium back in the 30s or the 40s. And you're trying to get that peephole in the walls at, at, behind the bleachers so you can see some of the action of the baseball game. Okay, so that's what the angel of death is doing for Yoshua ben Levi. Hey, get on my shoulders and you can look, peek over, and you can see what it's like. He asked him, Yoshua ben Levi asks the angel of death, lift me up a little bit more. Wait, I can't see. I can't see. Come on, push a little bit more. And he lifted him up. He, Yoshua ben Levi, jumped and fell on the other side. Ha ha, I fooled the angel of death. I'm here. I'm here in the world to come. I'm still alive. Nobody goes into the world to come alive. But Yoshua ben Levi is alive. I uh, fell on the other side. The angel of death grabbed him by the corner of his garment. So as Yahshua ben Levi's falling, the angel of death grabs him by his cloak. He, Yahshua ben Levi, said to the angel of death, I swear I won't leave this place. I'm here in the world to come alive, and I ain't leaving, no matter what you try to do. The Holy One, blessed be he, said, if he, 
Yoshua ben Levi ever asked to have one of his vows nullified, he must return. If not, then he need not return. Right? So if 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 the if Yoshua ben Levi ever made a vow in his lifetime that he then wanted nullified, then out of here. But if he never did that, right? So he was he was perfect his whole life, then he can stay. He, the angel of death, said to him, "Okay, if you're going to stay, return my knife." He did not return it. A voice from above called out, "Give it to him." That is, give the knife to the angel of death, because without it, people cannot die. End of story. Okay, so bizarre story, bizarre story. But a couple of things I want to say about it. Okay, so first, any questions you have before I, or any anybody have a question online that is watching, um, that want to um, ask a question about this before we go on. Any thoughts? Uh, yes, Judy. So you sure Ben Lane was staying? Behind the wall in heaven, supposedly, and he's still alive? Right. So, the, yes. Yoshua ben Levi is behind the wall. That is, he's in heaven or in the world to come, still alive, according to this story. That's right. He didn't have to go back. But he just had to give back the knife. Why does he want to be there still alive? Why does he want to be there still alive? We'll get to that in a couple of minutes, but that's a, a most important point of the story. Why does he want to get there still alive okay well so hold that thought as to why again uh you also have to think about who wrote the story and whether the story really happened okay because who's coming back and telling us who's telling us that Yehoshua ben levi is in the world to come alive okay so just think about that just think about that harvey uh, yeah it sounds like a story that, that could have been written for the twilight a uh, sounds like a Twilight Zone episode. Yes, it could be, right? You want Rod Rod Serling to be narrating. <laughs> yes, you know, Shuv, I can't even do his voice, right? <laughs> but yes, you can picture uh, you can picture that a, a black and white uh, television, and yes, it'd be perfect. Adriana, what were you going to say? Why is it in Tractate Kitubo? Okay, so because uh, as we know from Talmud class. The Talmud goes off on a lot of tangents. So even if I were to check page 77b of uh, Kitubot, I probably wouldn't find the original topic that that was on. But, um, okay, any other questions before I, before I start answering your question, Adriana, and getting to the other points? Okay, so there are stories about rabbis appear throughout the Talmud. And uh, the Yoshua ben Levi story that comes to my mind uh, when I read this story, because he's with lepers, is from the old Mahsur that we don't use anymore now, uh, the introduction to the Ne'ilah service. So it, see if you remember this. If you're here for Ne'ilah, and if you've been here for Ne'ilah the past 20 years, I've read this story. Well, not 20 years, because... Uh, Use this. We got this machsor two years into my tenure here. So we've for the past 18 years I've been reading this before the Neila service. This story, if he, uh, heart, uh, the editor of this machsor does not tell you where the sources come from on the page. You have to look to the very back, and he'll tell you page so and so. It comes from this place. So this is from this, the Talmud tractate Sanhedrin. One late afternoon, Rabbi Joshua ben Levi found Elijah standing at the entrance to a cave. When will the Messiah come? Joshua ben Levi asks Elijah. Elijah responded, ask him, where is he at the city gate? How will I recognize him? He sits among the diseased poor, which for the editor of our Machsur, he it could be a nicer way of saying, he sits among the lepers. And our story here and Calderon is about lepers. All, the, all of the others loosen every one of their bandages at the same time and bind them all again, but he loosens and binds the bandages over his sores one by one, for he thinks, perhaps I'll be needed, I must be ready to go at once. Rabbi Joshua ben Levi went to see him. Shalom to you, my teacher. 
said the Messiah, Shalom to you, Ben Levi. When will his lordship come? Today. Rabbi Joshua returned to Elijah, who asked, what did he tell you? Surely he lied to me, for he said that he's, he's coming today, and he hasn't come. Replied Elijah, you misunderstood him. He was citing scripture for you. Surely he had a mind a verse from Psalms. Today shall I come, if only all of you would listen to my voice. Then it goes on with a responsive reading and how we should all be ready for the Messiah to come. Okay, so this is Yoshua ben Levi. Uh, Yoshua ben Levi story talking to Elijah and to uh, and uh, that Elijah is found among the lepers. Okay, I'm convinced that I didn't so I didn't look up the source, but I'm convinced that diseased poor doing the bandages. It's it's the lepers. Okay, so a little bit about Yehoshua ben Levi. Okay, so there's an encyclopedia of the sages of the Talmud, one of the uh, reference volumes. You know, when I was in rabbinical school, it was pre-internet. So you had to buy basic reference books that would carry you through rabbinical school and then hopefully carry you through your rabbinate as well. But now there's the internet. Uh, there's probably a Wikipedia article about Rabbi John Yehoshua ben Levi, but I did it the old-fashioned way and pulled it off my shelf. And there's a five-page article, well, five-column article, about Rabbi Yehoshua ben Levi here. And so there are many stories in the Talmud about Yehoshua ben Levi's interaction with Elijah the prophet, so who is Elijah the prophet? What does Elijah do? What's his role in Jewish tradition? Does anybody know? He the Messiah. What? He precedes, the Messiah. he precedes the Messiah. He's the one who's going to be escorting the Messiah back. And why is Elijah the one to do that? Of all the prophets. He never died. He never died. Okay. Elijah never died. We're told in the Bible that uh, Elijah passed the mantle, literally, his cloak, uh, on to his student, his star student, Elisha. And this is in the book of Kings. And uh, uh, when Elijah passed the mantle on to Elisha, Elijah ascended to heaven in a fiery chariot. That's what we're told. doesn't say he died just said that he went up to heaven in a fiery chariot. So because of that, uh, there's rabbinic, lots of rabbinic traditions about who Elijah is and what his role now is in Olam Haba, the world to come, and down in this world. And so uh, Elijah then becomes the one, because he's still alive, he's going to be the one to bring about the, the coming of the Messiah. Okay, so that's one of the things that Elijah does. Also, uh, we're told throughout the Talmud, whenever the rabbis can't answer, can't solve a halachic problem, an issue surrounding a matter of Jewish law, when it ends with not one side winning out over the other, it ends in teku. So teku is a modern Hebrew word now, but it is an abbreviation in the Talmud. What does teku stand for? It says it stands for tishbi yitaretz, tishbi will solve, kushyot ubayot, questions and problems. Who's tishbi? Elijah, Eliyahu Hanavi, Eliyahu Ha. Tishbi. There you go. So Elijah the Tishbite. So when we're introduced to Elijah for the first time in the Book of Kings, that's that's how we're introduced to him by his name, uh, Elijah from the clan of Tishbi. So uh, so Tishbi Yetaretz Kushiotabayot, the first letter of each one of those four words, makes the word Teku. So if anything ends in a tie today, a soccer match in Israel ends in a tie. It's a teku. Okay, but for the Talmud, it's something a little bit more profound 
and uh, earth-shattering than a tie game. It's more of a matter of Jewish law, and who's going to solve it? The rabbis say, don't worry, even though we can't solve it today, we know the Messiah will come, and Elijah's going to answer all these questions. So there are lots of instances then in the Talmud of rabbis meriting a conversation with Elijah, and um, dialogue and 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 uh, and asking for Elijah to let the rabbi see into the future or see into Olam Haba or give them extra powers. So Yehoshua ben Levi, the article here in the encyclopedia doesn't say why he is seen as such a special person, but he is. He lived in the town of Lod which is where the airport in Israel is located today, uh, right outside that. Lod is in uh, the Haggadah. The four rabbis who are up studying all night and the student comes, hey, rabbis, it's time for the Shema of the morning. There might be a section that you might skip in the Haggadah, but it's it's right there um, uh, before Manishtana. And um, so they're in Lod. They're in uh, somebody's uh, attic in Lod. So, uh, so Lod was a is a is a major town, a place where rabbis gathered to study. Uh, you know, Shua ben Levi was a representative of the Jewish community. He's a, a transitional generation between the end of the Mishnah and the start of the Talmud. So we're talking about third century CE. So he lived in the 200s in the land of Israel, and he represented Jewish interests uh, to Rome. So he was the representative uh, to argue Jewish, uh, the Jewish national cause to the Roman representative in Judea, in the land of Israel, and he also went on missions to Rome. But his, uh, he was not known as a halachist, so he's, in other words, he's, his main work was not with uh, interpreting Jewish law. His work was with developing Agadah, Jewish lore. Okay, so when we talked a couple of weeks ago about the different two different kinds of interpretation of the Bible, one is to interpret for the sake of uh, developing Jewish law. One is for the sake of developing Jewish lore. So that's what Yehoshua ben Levi did. He uh, developed stories and, and, and taught morals and values from the Bible. So he promoted a sense of humility, and he was known for teaching among the lepers. Okay? Now, who are, who are the lepers? These are not people afflicted with leprosy. Okay, so as we know from the Torah... The Torah describes for us in the portion Mitzorah people who are afflicted with this skin condition. The old English translations always translated as leprosy, but the term is Tsara'at. And Tsara'at today, Tsara'at is under how it's described in the Torah. It's clear that it is something that uh, resolves on its own and you are cured of it, okay? So it's, it's not psoriasis, it's not eczema, which are incurable skin ailments, and it's certainly not leprosy, okay? So, which is also incurable. So leprosy according to, and, and so our, even the new translation uh, maintains the word leper, but it's, it's clear from the commentaries that it's, it's some kind of skin ailment. But still, the point is, whether it's leper or not, someone afflicted with this skin condition is not, is not permitted to remain with the community. They have to be outside the community. Okay, so they are shunned for a particular period of time until they are cured. So in the Torah, there's a cure. The Kohen comes to inspect the rash, and depending on the nature of the rash and the color of the rash, and whether there's hair growing in the rash or not, 
the Kohen will determine how long the person needs to be isolated. And then after seven days, the Kohen will come again. If there's progress, then the Kohen will make one particular, not a diagnosis, but a um, uh, say how much longer they have to uh, be in isolation, or they could, they could start coming back, but there's a ritual of purification special for someone afflicted with this kind of skin ailment. So someone who is a uh, someone who is afflicted with sarat. They're supposed to bring a special bird sacrifice, and um, the uh, the blood has to be sprinkled on the person and in the altar. It's really bizarre kind of stuff, but that's what the book of Leviticus is filled with, kind of bizarre kind of purification rites. And then the person is welcomed back into the community. Well, if there's no temple standing and one is afflicted with this, it's a little bit harder to become part of the community again. You still have the taboo about being associated with a person that has this kind of ailment, but there isn't a um, solution when the temple isn't standing. The only solution, according to the Torah, is to bring a sacrifice. You can't bring a sacrifice if the temple isn't standing, then what do you do? if you are afflicted with the skin ailment. So uh, that's why these people are the, um, I, I, so it doesn't have to be literally understood to be someone who has this skin ailment. It's, it's the disadvantage in a community, and that's why maybe Rabbi Harlow in the Mahzor uh, calls them the diseased poor, which is what they are. Because if you're shunned from the community, you can't exactly have a job and can't exactly interact with people in a regular business-like kind of way. So it's a problem for you if you have such, such a condition. So they could be shunned, they could be forgotten and, and ignored by the community. But Yehoshua ben Levi, because of his personal approach to Torah and wanting to make Torah accessible for all, would study with those people, so-called lepers. So Calderon, in her story, uh, talks about how every, every Friday he'd be studying with the lepers. And in that encyclopedia, there are lots of stories of him on a Friday. On a Friday afternoon, he'd, he'd listen to his grandson teach him the portion of the week. Like, so he'd ask his girl, what'd you learn in school today? Uh, and the grandson would tell him all about the portion of the week. And one week he forgot to ask his grandson. He was at the mikveh already, purifying himself, getting ready for Shabbat. As, as he was disrobed and about to go into the mikveh, he remembered he forgot to, that he had forgotten to ask his grandson about the, the weekly Parsha. So he, ran, he got, quickly got dressed, ran out of the mikveh, and found his grandson. And so people ask, what are you running out of the mikveh for just to talk to your grandson? You know, your grandson, he's not a, a Torah scholar, and, and you know, Shobin Levy says, but that's the point. you got to hear words of Torah from, from a child, and he quotes a verse from Proverbs about how, how important that is. So, so that's Yoshua know, Ben Levy. He cares about the disadvantage in the community, cares about children, and he's a very modest, humble person. So that's who, that's who lepers are. And that's the, the idea about the story, about the, the context. What's he doing studying with, studying Torah with lepers? But the bigger point now is the idea of his confrontation with the angel of death. Okay, so there is, um, so in Yiddish, the angel of death is the Malach Amavis, Right, so those of you who know Yiddish, know that term, Malach HaMavis, which in modern Hebrew is pronounced Malach HaMavet. Okay, it's the exact same words, it's just different pronunciation, different accent to it. So the angel of death. So we, we have to understand that uh, the, uh, the rabbi's uh, understanding of the way of the world is that there are these angels who are uh, assigned by God to perform individual 
uh, one-time only missions in the world. And then there are a couple of angels that perform the same mission all the time. So the angel of death is one such, uh, one such angel that does the same job over and over again, countless times to everyone who dies, as opposed to other angels who are assigned a one-time mission. So they come down from heaven, perform the mission on earth, and go back to heaven. Okay, so the idea behind that... Uh, uh, that role of the angel, what the angel does, comes from um, last week's Torah reading. So the, the portion Vayera begins with three angels coming to Abraham to inform Abraham and Sarah that in a year's time, Sarah is going to uh, be pregnant and give birth to a son. Okay, so who are these three angels? And then there's a thought as the story unfolds, two of these angels go on to the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to find Abraham and Sarah's nephew, Lot, to, inform, to save Lot and his wife and daughters from the city before God destroys the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. So if the Torah says two of the angels went to Sodom and Gomorrah, what happened to the third angel? Why didn't all three angels, after talking to Abraham and Sarah, then continue to Sodom and Gomorrah? So the rabbis answer, okay, this teaches us something, that one of those angels' job was to inform Abraham and Sarah. He finished his job, so he left. The other two still had to take care of destroying the cities and saving uh, Lot and his family. So that's their mission one of them to destroy the cities, one of them to save Lot and his family. So that from this cryptic um, uh, event in the, in the Torah reading, the rabbis understand the role of the angel in the world. So the word malach literally means messenger, but with, in the time of the rabbis, it takes on also a more heavenly kind of role. So you have an angel that appears to uh, Jacob in the middle of the night. Jacob uh, has a wrestling match with an angel, and the angel then, at the end of the wrestling match, gives Jacob his new name, Israel. Uh, you have an angel who appears to a man named Manoach and his wife to let them know that in a year's time a baby will be born, and that baby is Samson. So there are angels that appear just like that. So, And then you have the book of Job, which has another angelic kind of being there, which is Satan. Okay? So Satan is not, Satan in, the, in our Bible, in the Jewish Bible, is not the Christian idea of Satan. Not, it's not the devil. Satan is uh, the protagonist. Literally, that's the role of Satan, is to argue the other side. So not the devil's advocate, but, but and not necessarily the advocate in terms of a lawyer. It would be God's advocate or the prosecutor. That would be a better understanding of what the role of Satan is in the, story, in the, in the book of Job. And it's just because Satan then, in that book, carries out punishments uh, to Job, uh, later biblical sources, namely the Christian Bible, take the, the uh, Satan to be the devil. Okay, but so you have Satan who is this angelic being, a higher being that is an eternal being, and then you have the angel of death as well. The angel of death uh, does not appear in the Torah. No, that's not true. The angel of death, what am I saying? <laughs> kind of rabbi am I? The, what the, the tenth plague, of course, is the angel of death. Okay, so the tenth plague in Egypt is the angel coming down. Uh, so the, the um, Charlton Heston movie is the, the see it in color, is the, the green mist that, uh, that comes uh, th throughout Egypt. 
and kills the firstborn, that green mist is the angel of death. Of course, the angel of death appears in the Torah. Um, and so because it's in the Torah, the rabbis have to do something with it. So the idea that there are angels in the Torah and then angels in the Bible mean that the rabbis can't say, no, we don't agree with this theologically, with this understanding of angels. Because what does that mean? That you have these heavenly kind of creatures. Are they gods as well? If they're not gods, how do they get there? Who becomes an angel? Um, wh who created these angels? So if, if you uh, look up angels, um, angels in Judaism or something like that on the internet, or if you have the Encyclopedia Judaica and look up angelology, there's such a term, you have a several page article about uh, this whole concept of Jewish angels. And there's a lot in the Talmud and other rabbinic literature about all the names of all the angels. And so um, the name Raphael, God heals, that's one of the angels. That's one of the angels actually who came to Abraham because he was sitting outside of his tent recuperating after his bris. And so Raphael, the healer, God heals is the name of that angel who comes. Gabriel is another angel. Michael, Michael, another angel. So these are common names that a lot of people have as their own Hebrew names. So, but these are uh, names, three names of angels. But there are some other bizarre, like Metatron is another angel. And, and so there are a lot of names. If you're really into that, then I would um, steer you to look at that Encyclopedia Judaica article. But be that as it may, there are lots of stories in the Talmud about rabbis' encounters with the angels, and especially rabbis' encounters with the angel of death. So, so something uh, so gets, uh, leads us back to our story, that this story is not a one and only story just about Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi. It's a, it's a story that fits a theme and a pattern of all the rabbis in the Mishnah and the Talmud. Anybody who's a famous rabbi has stories about him that, that highlight their almost supernatural powers. Okay, from, from a, a story like Rabbi Akiva, who is being tortured by the Romans, and uh, while he's dying, he's reciting the Shema and teaching that that phrase, "V'ahavta et Adonai Elohecha b'chol avavcha b'chol nafshecha b'chol maodecha." Love the Lord your God with all your with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. Oh, I never understood how can you love God with all your might. Now I get it. As I'm being tortured by the Romans, now I get this. That's, that's, a, that's what he's thinking as he's being tortured, not screaming in agony. He's teaching to his students right there while he's being tortured. So uh, from that kind of story to a more pleasant kind of story in which the rabbis go up into heaven, have an encounter with God, have a, have a teaching session with God, and come on back down to earth, to share with the students about that. So the stories are written by, uh, it's unclear who is writing the stories about these rabbis. What's certainly clear is that they are not historical. They're not, no, they're not factual, okay? The point of the story is to use the rabbi as a symbol to, uh, or a vehicle to teach a particular lesson. So the, the lessons that we want to learn from this story are, well, okay, so let, let, me, let me ask it instead of me telling and suggesting, what do you suppose the rabbis want us to learn from this story about the knife? So getting beyond the, uh, the, the, the detail of the story, Let's think beyond the detail. What do the rabbis want us to be learning from this story? Yeah? Who can? The rabbi had control, but couldn't control his death. 
And by doing this, he he's like entering another level in the world. Okay, so so Peggy is suggesting he couldn't control his death, but he's entering some other level in the world. So I would argue that he is controlling his death because he doesn't die. He just he goes alive into the world to come. So he's not in this world anymore. Oh, okay. So so Yoshua ben Levi is making the decision as to whether he lives or dies, but uh, so he can he can have control over his own life. But when he tries to keep the knife, he can't keep the knife. So in other words, he has control over his own death. He doesn't die, but he doesn't have the power to make all of us for eternity immortal. Right? So there, so there's that. So there is this element that is common in Talmudic stories about facing mortality. And uh, whether we have any power over the angel of death. And so if we become a rabbi and if we study intently and if we are modest and humble and if we are saintly all the time, maybe we can be like Yehoshua ben Levi. And maybe we can fool the angel of death. But there's no way that we are able to have the power to help anybody else fool the angel of death. Okay, so there are stories like this in which the rabbi, even rabbis die and come back to life to be able to, to continue teaching and uh, sharing, sharing lessons with people. So, so the idea of facing our mortality is an important one. What's another a lesson that the rabbis want us to learn from the story. Okay. Right. So, uh, so Adriana is saying wh uh, what we do in this life can determine what happens to us after. So God uh, making the comment about Yehoshua ben Levi uh, saying, if he has, has asked for any of his vows nullified, then he can't stay. But if he hasn't, then he can stay. So in other words, the whole idea of, of taking a vow, it's not the only, uh, the only connection we have that is with Kol Nidre. Okay, so Kol Nidre uh, at that service is asking that any promises that we make, any, that's how it's translated in the Mafsur, but any vows we take, during the coming year, they should be considered null and void because we're really not supposed to be making any kind of vow. And we don't understand this. You know, if any of us has been called to testify in court, we're asked to swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and by putting our hand on a Bible. So, you know, I haven't had that experience to do that. Um, I haven't taken an oath, an oath of office to become a member of cabinet or anything like that. But that's, that's similar to taking a vow. You are taking God's name and therefore using God's name as collateral for this promise that you're making. So it's not, it's not like a pinky swear that you make with your friend when you're in kindergarten. It's much more serious than that because if you, you are using God's name, for this promise, you are putting your life in your hands, okay? Because if you take God's name in vain, then you're going to die. Because the Torah says that anyone who takes God's name in vain will die. So that's why some people are very careful about uh, when, it's, when you're not reciting a prayer during the service and you would be reciting a prayer at some other time, you would say Hashem, instead of Adonai, because, so I think in an educational setting, it's okay to say Adonai. But there are other people who would not. They would say Adoshem or Hashem, anything, because they don't want to take God's name in vain. And when writing it, also would write a substitute for God's name, whether the letter He with an apostrophe or letter Dalit with an apostrophe, writing on a blackboard or something like that. So that way, because if you write it down, 
then it's holy and you can't throw it away. So God's name is very serious. And uh, by taking a vow, you are doing something very serious. And not everybody has the um, religious makeup in order to be seriously religious and spiritual all the time to constantly remember the vow that you have taken. So the, the vow that, uh, such a vow that the Torah talks about is the Nazarite vow. That it, it talks in the book of Numbers that if, if you want to take on extra spirituality, you can for a minimum of 30 days. You can't do it for less than 30 days. For a minimum of 30 days, you let your hair grow and uh, you can't shave and you refrain from all grape products. Can't eat a grape, can't drink grape juice, can't drink wine for 30 days. So, and at the end of your 30-day period, or it, you could be a Nazarite for the rest of your life, any, anything from 30 days to the rest of your life, that's how long your Nazarite vow can be. But as when you, let's say you, you take on the Nazarite vow for two months, at the end of the vow, you have to bring a sacrifice marking the end of that period. The rabbis, some rabbis, especially medieval rabbis, were against the idea of taking the Nazarite vow because it's very difficult to maintain that extra spirituality all the time. Right? So it, it's enough to add into your routine davening once a day, twice a day, three times a day. That's so hard to do all the time. And then making it as a vow to do this, it is even harder. <clears throat> and if you break the vow, it's not like, oh, you know, not a big deal. I'll make it up tomorrow. I'll pray six times tomorrow instead of not having prayed today. If you break the vow, you're breaking God. And you can't break God's name. If he had, if he had nullified a vow, they, he wouldn't be allowed to stay in heaven. But that... But the fact that he could stay in heaven meant that he never had a vow nullified, which meant that he maintained this saintly personality and demeanor his whole life as a rabbi, which is, um, is that true? We have no idea. We have no idea. All we know about Yoshua ben Levi is what the Talmud says about mm -hmm. Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi. So... Did he? We have. Did so. Barbara's asking. Did he actually exist? We have no idea. Okay, I, I'm not sure if there are any um, corroborating evidence that proves any of the rabbis from the Mishnah of the Talmud existed. Okay, so we have old manuscripts of the Mishnah and the Talmud which don't go back all the way to the time of the mission of the Talmud, but almost. So we know the books themselves are old. But do we have any evidence that Rabbi Akiva existed? Or well, So we have evidence in the Mishnah and the Talmud that they had encounters with Roman officials. But I don't know if we have Roman historians talking about those very same officials having encounters with rabbis. <clears throat> the uh, Roman, Roman historians do talk about Jews, and they certainly talk about the destruction of the temple and the destruction of the, of the Jewish community in the, prov in the uh, province of, uh, of Judea. That we have evidence from that. Uh, we have Josephus, uh, who is a Jewish historian, uh, talking about some of the rabbis of the time. So it's possible that some of these rabbis were actual historical figures. We do know from the Christian Bible about their being rabbis, but they, um, I think one of the rabbis is, is actually named in the Christian, I think Rabbi Gamliel is in the Christian Bible. Don't quote me, but I think, I think there is a rabbi's name given in the Christian Bible. So is that corroborating evidence? I don't know. Because the Christian Bible is not written from the time about which the events take place. So it's unclear where the, did these rabbis exist. I would say yes, 
these rabbis existed, but certainly the stories written about them are not true. They are meant to, the point of these stories is to teach us a lesson about how we can strive to be just like them. So case in point is Rabbi Akiva, who was a shepherd for until he was 40. He falls in love with a beautiful woman who is a daughter of one of the wealthiest people in the Jewish community. So he can't marry her because he's just a shepherd. So he has to start learning and become literate. So he studies in the yeshiva, and there are lots of stories about how he, since he's poor already, he, he's even poorer, sitting in the back rows of the yeshiva, learning the Aleph Bet, and listening to the arguments until he becomes the teacher. And how his wife, or almost wife, waits patiently for him to become a rabbi so that he can, she can marry him. And then once they get married, he goes back to the yeshiva. So there are lots of stories like we read about, uh, there are other stories in here about women, wives of rabbis who wait endlessly for their husbands to return to them. So to highlight how important study is, so there are lots of stories that the rabbis write to teach us lessons for our lives. If the rabbis can do it, they say anybody else can do it. Now, well, not, not everybody can make it into Gan Eden, into the Garden of Eden, or Lama Ba, but the idea is anybody can become a rabbi and we should try to live up to their, their ideals. But the, uh, the other idea about the angel of death is that, uh, like I said, there are, there are lots of stories in the Talmud as well about dealing with death. And why is the angel of death coming? Um, uh, what is the reason for someone being punished by the angel of death coming? And uh, so there are lots of stories in the Talmud as well as, as um, about, because some of the laws in the Talmud, no, some of the laws in the Torah are that if you violate this law, uh, the punishment is death. And it's not death by a human court, it's death by God. So how do we know that uh, God is going to be doing this? And so there are stories then of the angel of death coming. So King David meets the angel of death, even biblical figures uh, in stories that are not in the Bible. The rabbis come up with stories about uh, the biblical figures coming into uh, contact with the angel of death. So it's a it's a common theme. A Chagad Yah story has the angel of death in it, right? The Chagad Yah song at the end of the Seder. One of the characters near the end is the, is the angel of death. So it's a, it's a con and and if you have an illustrated Haggadah, the angel of death is either holding this tall scythe or uh, a knife, like in in our story. That's the or sword or something like that. Um, okay, so um, any other comments or questions about the story? Yes, Adriana. It's interesting that he says, I swear I won't this place. Oh, there you go. So, uh, uh, right. So, and there he is making a vow. Uh, so Adriana is saying he, he swears that he won't leave this place. Um Right. So uh, in this, so the story is written in the tractate Ketubot. Does this? I, I guess this happens at the end of his life. Um, and so, uh, right, he's not leaving the place. <laughs> right. But we don't know. I, I, according to that article in the encyclopedia about the sages of the Talmud, it doesn't it tell us about how he dies. So it's possible that his that, that students write this story about him. So if they have if if Yoshua ben Levi has these stories about encounters with Elijah, and he has cons he has many encounters with Elijah, and Elijah never died, then Yoshua ben Levi didn't die either. And he got to stay in Olam Haba alive. So that's that would be the ideal that uh, that people would want to have because, of course, of the fear of dying. So Yoshua ben Levi was such a good person. He didn't have to fear about dying. He got to go there alive. And he kept the knife. And what? And he did not keep the knife. He had to give it back. But, so he must have had a vow. 
God, oh, God told me. Yes, that's right. That's right. That's right. Okay. So I, I, uh, I don't have anything else to say about the story. Yes, go ahead, Peggy. Yes. Takes the whole idea of the lepers, namely. Yes. You know, to show what he was such a a sinner and everything. Yes, and there are stories about lepers themselves too. Um, There's um, the haftarah for the portion mitzora. Uh, when it comes in Leviticus, there's a story about four lepers in the Book of Kings who uh, save the uh, the northern kingdom of Israel from attack by the Assyrian Empire. So the city of Shomron, the capital of the northern kingdom, is under siege by the uh, Assyrian general. And these lepers are outside the city, and somehow the four lepers... Uh, march into the um, into the encampment of the Assyrians, and the way they're walking, God makes it sound as if a huge army is attacking the Assyrians. The Assyrians up and run and leave, and the um, the northern kingdom of Israel is saved. So you have as there's one positive story about lepers in the Bible, and here we have Yahushua ben Levi, who um, who makes the lepers, who empowers the lepers, and make them feel as if they're part of the community, teaches them Torah. So so though um, we don't have these so-called lepers in our community, we do have them as a metaphor for anyone who doesn't have contact with Torah, who is impoverished in Torah, just like the lepers were impoverished uh, literally themselves. And so it's, it's an idea of how we deal with the, the other in society today. And Yehoshua ben Levi was willing to be with the other, right? Just like Mother Teresa Her life work was being with the poor and sick of India. So these saintly kind of people, that's Yehoshua ben Levi, and and there are other rabbis who um, teach the value. There are rabbis who are known uh, to be uh, terrible people, and they had no patience for anybody who was different or anybody who was ignorant or even not even ignorant, but just not as smart as them. So there are these um, uh, arrogant rabbis, <laughs> but there are also stories of the total opposite kind of rabbi, and that's Yehoshua ben Levi. Yes. Any other thoughts or comments? All right. So next week, uh, our last story is going to be the story of Alicia. Uh, that is Alicia ben Abuya. The, um, the student of Rabbi Meir, who uh, a common term today is he went off the derech. So in the, uh, in the ultra-Orthodox community, you're either on the derech or you're off the derech, the derech being the way. So if you're following the rules and you're doing everything, following all the mitzvot, you're on the derech. If you're not observing the commandments, and you're kind of violating some, you're off the derech. So Alicia ben Abuya went off the derech. So we'll read that story next time. Alicia, the story is Alicia, and it's on page um, 123 in Ruth Calderon's book. So we'll see you all next time.